Hello, photo builders, Rafael Navarre here. Welcome to another master masterclass. Today we're going to learn how to photograph the northern lights, the aurora borealis, with the amazing Tor Ivar. Nice, Tor. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. So my name is Tor Ivar. I am a hobbyist uh, and enthusiastic landscape photographer from northern Norway. And I've been doing photography for the last 10 years, 12 years or so. Uh, big, uh, it's been on and off since I started. And uh, well, I'm here for the Northern Lights, uh, which are the photos I'm most uh, famous for. Uh, I was very early out uh, since I was 10 years ago. Not many people were doing Northern Lights photography because of, well, you needed to be, of course, where the northern lights are, and also the gear limitations. Today, you can shoot the northern lights with your uh, with your smartphone, so it's becoming more and more available now. And uh, awesome, I guess the smartphone too. Cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. I know or with uh, the iPhone, which I'm shooting uh, with um, for a phone, of course. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. a Sony Nordic, uh, Sony Alpha Nordic ambassador. Mm -hmm. So I do shoot with, uh, only with Sony gear. Awesome, awesome. I mean, uh, thank, you, thank you so much for joining us because this is one of the classes we haven't covered yet in Photopills. Actually, in the Photopills app, we have not included the Northern Lights yet. Hopefully, we'll include them in, in the future. But I know that many people in the Photopills community are super excited about this class. And uh, guys, guys that you are there, please, if you have a question, just leave your uh, question in the chat because we have, as always, Sandra Vallaure in the chat and she will collect the, your questions for me and I'll ask them to Tor Ivar. So Tor, Ivar, you ready? I am ready. We can start the class. Yeah, right. So I'll, uh, I have this, uh, my keynotes here, if you can see them now. Uh, yes, yes. Here we see them. Perfect. All right. So uh, I thought I would start about, uh, with uh, where you can see the Northern Lights. Many of you already know this. Uh, you can see the Northern Lights basically uh, around the entire uh, magnetic sphere uh, in the northern hemisphere. I uh, live in northern Norway, uh, which is basically below the aurora oval, which you can see in uh, in the screen uh, shot I've got from uh, space weather uh, live which is a, a web page that i use uh, as a part of my northern lights resources when planning when uh, to go out and shoot uh, when i say when i go out to plan and shoot i do work as a full-time air traffic controller and i'm a father so uh, i have to go out <laughs> when time to do so. So basically when it's clear skies, which is uh, why uh, northern Norway especially and also northern uh, Sweden and Finland is good places to go to for the northern lights because we are uh, right below the aurora oval or aurora uh, jet stream, which is also called uh, cold. Uh, that means that uh, during low activity, you would be able to also see very good uh, northern lights displays uh, because you're right below where it always happens. Uh, mm -hmm. Other places like Iceland, Faroe Islands, uh, Mid-Norway, uh, and now I'm only speaking for Scandinavia, which I know because you can see the Northern Lights, of course, in Canada as well, and also in Siberia, but I don't know uh, how to get to those <laughs> very easily. But uh, Tromsø in Northern Norway, uh, I'm giving them credit now. I think it would be the very best 
location if you're only uh, interested in seeing the Northern Lights because it's easy to get to. Uh, from our capital, Oslo, you would have a direct flight to Tromsø. And also Alta, which is not that famous. It's a smaller city, but it's also a direct flight from Oslo. Yeah, I can't um, wait to organize. I can't wait to organize a Philippos expedition to Lofoten. To, to <laughs> yeah, Lofoten is, also, Lofoten is also a good one, but you would need to make some extra effort to get there. But uh, the Lofoten Islands is, as I uh, talked initially about, it's uh, one of those uh, hotspots for photography on this planet, um, similar to Iceland. Faroe Islands, Patagonia, Greenland, all those big names within the photography industry because it's so much landscape within such a small uh, area or region. So uh, I'll get over to the next slide and you'll get, of course, my uh, key points here. I, I don't bother with, with giving them one and one. Uh, it's uh, no point. But for Northern Lights photography, you have the KP index, which is like, uh, I would say, the commercialized uh, way of predicting the Northern Lights. The KP index is a geographical indication of the magnetic field around uh, our planet uh, which gives you an idea of how far south you'll be able to see the northern lights uh, so a kp zero would basically mean that you would have to be in uh, Tromsø or uh, further north uh, or south uh, not very much, depending on where you see it. I don't, if I go back on this slide here, and uh, Tromsø would be on a KP1, uh, you would be able to see the northern lights in the northern uh, horizon of Tromsø. KP2, you would see them right above your head. And I think this particular image here would be something like a KP4 or 5, because it's measured from the magnetic north pole uh, where the magnetic streams would meet and you would have uh, geographical uh, distances from that point and southwards uh, on the globe uh, depending on high, how high the number is. So uh, KP0 would be the lowest and KP9 would be the highest number. And I think on a KP9, you would theoretically be able to see the Northern Lights from mid Germany or in the middle of the United States. That does not happen very often. Uh, so uh, I would not go on a photography trip to mid Germany. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the Northern Lights, that is. So, uh, the KP index is measured from uh, stations uh, which are located in uh, the, in the area of London, uh, Copenhagen, and around that region. So if you're having a KP index of four, it would be like uh, the average measurement uh, predicted from those stations. So. As I said before, you would need uh, to be able to see the Northern Lights in Copenhagen or that latitude. Uh, you would need a KP4, 5 or 6, something in that region, which is a medium uh, Northern Lights storm, which does not happen uh, very often, maybe once or twice a month. But as, as you get further up north, uh, as I said before, Tromsø, the Lofoten Islands, uh, Northern Finland uh, or Sweden, you would need lower uh, a lower measurement geographically to be able to see them. And that's where I use the real time readings, which you can see in this uh, in this graph. 
where uh, the green graph here uh, is a measurement of the density in the Northern Lights. Uh, and as the density increases, you would have more and more Northern Lights in the sky. Uh, but to have the movement in the northern uh, in the northern lights, you would need the magnetic field also to be uh, get some sort of uh, vibration, which, which happens uh, if you follow this red graph here. So basically, you want uh, high peaks and high lows in uh, the red and the green graph. I'll give you guys a link to this. Uh, graph later on which is a nice indication if you are somewhere because uh, there's a list of locations where you can uh, kind of select where you're closest to which will give you a better indication of what's happening with the magnetic field of the earth uh, in relation to any solar activity which produces the northern lights Yes, please. So, it'll be awesome. It'll be awesome to have the links in the description of this masterclass that will be available right after we end the class. So it'll be awesome. You can send them to me so I can add yeah. them. That'd be cool. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so that, that's a little bit about uh, where uh, you can see in Northern Lights. I forgot to say when. So in, in uh, Northern uh, Scandinavia and also Finland, Iceland, Faroe Islands. Uh, we do have uh, the northern lights in the sky from about mid-September throughout March. Uh, you will be able to see them in the beginning of April and also in the late uh, week of August. But since we do have the midnight sun in between uh, May and late July, the sky is simply too bright to be able to see the northern lights. You, I think uh, the stars disappear from the sky uh, around mm, late April and they're not back in the sky until uh, uh, late August. And that's a kind of a telltale sign that it's getting closer to the northern light season or that it has ended. Because in order to see the northern lights, which are uh, more faint than stars, uh, you need to see stars in the sky, basically to be able to see the northern lights. So mid-September throughout uh, March. And uh, before the live show, we talked about uh, my favorite uh, season to shoot the northern lights. And they do both offer benefits and disadvantages. Uh, in autumn, you will have more easy access to hike and uh, to go uh, off the beaten path uh, with your car, travel like these gravel roads and uh, stuff like that, giving you um, the option to get away from, uh, from any ambient light uh, or uh, at least uh, the most part of the ambient light. We do have houses in the weirdest places in Norway because there's a long coastline and people uh, do like to isolate themselves a little bit. Uh, so it, it's easier to get access to different places. And especially if you like hiking, uh, it's easier to do in, in autumn than it is in winter because well, there's always a risk of avalanche and stuff like that during winter if you're not very familiar, which I highly recommend you to be if you're uh, out in the mountains during winter. Uh, winter, on the other hand, it's more difficult to go to uh, remote places but you have the advantage of uh, the snow acting as a reflective surface to the northern lights which gives you a, a brighter uh, landscape um, to shoot in throughout the winter you then i take away the fact that the moon will light up uh, some of the landscape we do have a uh, 
weird uh, moonrise moonset in uh, in Norway, uh, at least in northern Norway, because we, we're so far up north that you would have the moon would rise either quickly or it would stay above the horizon throughout uh, the day. It, it varies so much, but it's um, that's where the photo pills app comes into play when we, what you want to uh, to plan for the kind of landscape you want because during autumn you do have less reflective surfaces uh, you would have wet rocks uh, lakes and stuff like that which is accessible through hiking and uh, short uh, treks um, and as the last autumn storm hits and all the leaves on the trees kind of uh, blows away, you would have uh, very much a lot of silhouettes in the forest, which is, in my opinion, hard to work with. If you want the wider scene, so I usually tend to go for some foreground detail and uh, a mountain peak or something like that or even just a straight horizon, depending on where I am visiting at the time, because the northern lights will appear uh, somewhat uh, random, uh, but at the same time, not. As I was talking about before, the Aurora jet stream hits uh, basically the same place uh, most of the time, and it kind of moves uh, south and north on the sky, depending on uh, the uh, the intensity of the solar storm or magnetic storm happening. That's cool. So you, you would suggest like auroras from September to end uh, October uh, to have also the, <laughs> the, the, the fall colors in the trees uh, and avoid uh, November because there are no, no, no leaves on the trees? I would say uh, the last week, uh, let's say if you have a three week uh, time span, I would say between September and October, you would have nice autumn colors in Northern Norway. You would have uh, sunrise, sunset, and of course the Northern lights uh, available to you for a more uh, complete uh, photographic experience. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, because as night, uh, we have the midnight sun during summer, we have the opposite during winter. We have the polar nights where you don't see the sun at all above <laughs> the horizon from mid-December through well, third week of January or something like that. Wow, so you can shoot them the auroras all day, all night. <laughs> Yeah, during our darkest days in December, uh, you will be able to see the northern lights as early as maybe five in the afternoon and wow. it will last maybe until five in the morning if it's good. Uh, so, but <laughs> well, uh, the days are short in uh, December, very short if they're, uh, if you have. As I said before, it, it, it can get dark uh, around 1 or 2 uh, p.m. or in the afternoon. Uh, so you would have a little window to catch any colors uh, in the sky during that time, if you get any at all, uh, because the time span where the sun basically, it, it doesn't even grace the horizon, you would uh, you would get lucky. So we do have long blue hours and uh, long nights during winter time, and especially mm -hmm. from December throughout uh, January. So where I live, because uh, we have a long coastline and many high, well, high enough peaks, so I don't see the sun hitting my... Uh, <laughs> I launched till uh, mid February. So even though the day is getting brighter and brighter from uh, January and out, I don't see the sun until February. So, oh. hmm. yeah. So uh, in 
autumn, I would say, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, the transition between September and October is very good. Uh, you have all the options. Uh, mm -hmm. The same thing would be uh, the beginning of February through, well, mid-March or so around that time. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, I think we, we, have, we, we have a question from uh, Dan D. Lewis uh, right. related to the, the topic we're, we're covering now. Uh, for clarity of these dates, for best viewing related to is, is best viewing, uh, best we sorry, uh, are these dates for best viewing related to weather, amount of light, etc., or these days as also related to more or less magnetic activity. And I think it's something that you're going to cover in this presentation. Uh, let me just flip over. Is it uh, for clarity or these days uh, for best viewing related to weather amount of light? Yeah, OK, all right. So um, the uh, magnetic activity uh, are supposedly uh, more fragile during uh, what you call them. Uh, it's our darkest day. I, I can't remember what you call them. It's um, when the sun kind of returns. So it's uh, I can't I can't remember the day, but it, it's not very important. The magnetic uh, activity var varies uh, depending on the amount. Uh, of uh, solar activity so in relation to viewing the northern lights i would suggest avoiding uh, a quarter to a full moon and uh, the less moonlight you have the easier it is to see the northern lights in the sky as i mentioned before the northern lights uh, are dimmer than any stars and it is a lot dimmer than the moon so the moon would kind of absorb a lot mm -hmm. of lights being able to you're able to see in the northern lights the camera of course will capture more of uh, the northern lights during moon than you will be able to see with your eyes and it's natural because the camera does not need to adjust to night time uh, but your eyes do so i mean obviously the camera will uh, be exposing for a few seconds at higher eyes so you're not able to kind of control that with your eyes mm -hmm. uh, you of course have a higher dynamic range in your eyes than the camera does but um uh, if you're interested in just viewing the northern lights, I would avo avoid uh, especially the full moon. Uh, a little bit of moon doesn't really matter that much because uh, it needs to get above uh, at least a quarter to full a quarter full moon to uh, to kind of affect the landscape uh, to a degree where the northern lights will be dimmer than they are without that moon. Cool, cool. And photography-wise, I suppose to have a bit of moon helps you use a shorter, a shorter exposure time, and, and also capture uh, more detail in the in the foreground, right? The moon yeah. helps you both, both yeah, freeze right. the, the dance and the landscape. Yeah. Uh, the disadvantage is, however, uh, if the moon. Uh, kind of uh, hang in the sky where the northern lights are. Yeah, <laughs> you're losing out. Uh, but but it's this is something you can of course control a little bit with uh, the location you choose. Normally, when I choose a location uh, to shoot the northern lights, and a good example of a location like that is. Uh, for example, Jokul Salom, the glacier lagoon in Iceland. It's a wide area uh, where the mountains aren't uh, that tall because they're so far away. And you will be able to capture something in basically in any direction. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, maybe not towards the south because uh, 
there the road and the bridge is but you a good northern lights location would be in an open area as the glacier lagoon is for example mm -hmm. because if the northern lights happen uh, north or south or if they come above mm -hmm. your head you would have many options to shoot them and also be able to avoid the moon if necessary uh but if you want that specific capture of the northern lights you would have to take the risk yeah. uh if, if you're inside a valley for example uh, you're very limited to to the the direction you can shoot but uh, awesome. mm -hmm. you're able to control that somehow uh, because the northern lights do have this uh, highway that it starts out on during normal activity and it just varies a bit north and south depending on uh, the activity well it can vary a whole lot uh, south but uh, uh, during normal activity it basically starts in uh, the same vicinity every time uh, I have an image uh, later on which will uh, kind of highlight just that, which where I'm able to more or less plan uh, my Northern Lights capture. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Um, and now, uh, Tori, uh, you, you told me before that we're entering into the solar maximum now, so this uh, autumn and next winter next year is going to be like uh, the maximum activity for auroras for the yeah. past so, years exactly yeah so uh the sun goes in cycles where uh it's more active and less active and now we're entering a, uh a time where the sun is becoming more and more active so Without being a scientist, uh, we're enter we're getting closer to solar maximum. So it is a, an eleven year time span, I think, or twelve or thirteen. It it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, so I would say for the next five or six years, it is a good time to uh, to check uh, those aurora borealis of your uh, bucket list off your bucket list. Uh, because when the sun uh, is active, it produces more sunspots uh, and those sunspots uh, will from uh, time to time uh, launch solar flares into, um, well, towards Earth or elsewhere, but you basically want the, the ones that goes towards Earth uh, if you're interested in the northern lights. If the solar flares are powerful enough, uh, they may knock out uh, communication systems, uh, especially satellites and stuff like that, or uh, and electricity uh, systems. It, it happens very rarely, but there's a chance when, if you see a KP9, for example, to, to use this. Uh, measurement you would know that there's a huge uh, solar storm uh, heading towards earth and there is a chance of getting uh, a disturbance on radio signals and gps and stuff like that so uh, it will happen from time to time not too much but you would have uh, for example airplanes uh, on the ground instead of uh, in the air because of um, the high amount of uh, geomagnetic interference and also if you're flying a drone midday and there's a high uh, amount of uh, solar activity uh, pushing against the earth's uh, magnetic field you will also get gps disturbances on your uh, drone so you're you might be able to lose your drone midday for uh, for no apparent reason at all good to know yeah um i think that is initially what i wanted to say before i start on the technical parts if there aren't any questions in relation to when where and we have three three questions that can be 
answer first, I think. Uh, Kai Kaf, uh, do you have a link or website which provides real time info on the Northern Lights? Yes, I have this in my resources, uh, which I have uh, down here. Mm -hmm. These are the two sites that I use. I'll, uh, I'll send them to you and you can add them in the description awesome. or something. Yeah, these are the two pages that I use personally to uh, to get my Northern Lights information. I don't use any apps. I just use these two pages. Okay, perfect. Then we have uh, the, the, Dr. Ashish Mal Malhotra. How early can it be detected with the help of the apps? Uh, how many days in advance can we know about viewing the Northern Lights? That is a good question. Uh, again, I would have to um, underline I'm not a scientist, but what happens is, for example, if you have a solar flare uh, happening on the sun, uh, there the sun rotates in a four-week cycle, or we, we the sun doesn't rotate. We go around the sun in a four-week cycle, more or less, so a month. Mm -hmm. So... Four weeks ago, we had a solar storm happening because there was an active sunspot. The same thing happened uh, this weekend. So, but you cannot predict whether or not that sunspot is active. Uh, you can make a guesstimate. Uh, so I wouldn't book tickets uh, to go see the northern lights but there's a chance of course that you'll be able to see a magnetic storm if it happened four weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, and also there's a lot of debris and stuff like that outside our atmosphere which will dampen or disturb the effect of any uh, magnetic uh, storm potentially happening uh it doesn't because of all that debris and uh, asteroids and stuff like that things mm -hmm. happen away from the sun to the earth but uh usually you would have an indication let's say three days in advance which is a decent amount but still then you yeah, it is a reason they call it the elusive northern lights because it's it's not that easy to predict uh, a long time in advance but keep an eye on space weather live they will announce any solar uh, sunstorms happening and um, give you an indication of when it might when there's a higher chance of a great uh, geomagnetic storm uh, happening. And a geomagnetic storm basically means a very fun display of the Northern Lights to watch. That's cool. Yeah. OK, last question. And, yeah. Uh, Wayne Padgett, are, are the, there better times to avoid cloudy or stormy skies? I'm sorry. In, term, in terms of weather, uh, are there any special months we should avoid because of the storms or weather or cloudy days? <laughs> or it's cloudy every day? <laughs> it is super difficult to answer. Uh, some years we have, uh, like now, where I live, we have had uh, overcast for three weeks straight. Oh. Uh, yeah, so it happens because in Norway in particular, uh, the coastline uh, is uh, trapping the clouds more or less. So mm -hmm. we can have low hanging clouds here for a long time. And okay. in our neighbor fjord, it can be clear skies. So uh, being in the Lofoten Islands, for example, you're able to to drive easily away. If you're, uh, you can drive for one hour, and you will have a completely different weather. 
if you're going to Tromsø, you would have a three hour drive uh, from Tromsø to northern Finland, where it's uh, inland uh, climate, so much more dry and not so Mm -hmm. uh, not that much clouds there. Uh, so being able to move yourself around uh, in a rental car or something like that, I think it's crucial uh, to be able to see the northern lands. I do the same thing where I live. We have the weather is usually breaking, uh, changing from one fjord to another due to the mountains. So it, it's difficult to, uh, I mean, it's even impossible to predict the weather. Uh, and so long in advance, but um, mm -hmm. maybe uh, it is guessing, of course, um, in the transition between January and February, we are in the deepest winter and it's cold. Maybe then the weather is more stable, but then again, we can have uh, mm -hmm. 30 of snow every second day for three weeks so I mean, it's hard since it's a cold climate uh, it's very hard to predict the weather we we kind of get all the weather patterns uh, swiping across it. yeah it'll be helpful for nick page who is in the chat now hi nick i hope you get better from your back pain <laughs> uh so you want clouds to go to uh Lofot in norway so you want, we can go in and start learning how to photograph the yep. Borealis. So and I think this is my first one, yeah, gear. Uh, yeah, for camera, uh, as I said, uh, initially you can shoot the Northern Lights with your, uh, your uh, new smartphone today. Obviously, uh, it, might be more difficult and you won't be able to get all the details you can uh, with a full frame camera which is something many of us use for a full frame camera today is basically uh, available to anyone it used to be more of an enthusiast and pro level kind of gear but today they are yeah quite affordable many of them and the advantage of a full frame camera is uh, the ISO uh, sensitivity, uh, which I'll get into later on. But I do use a full frame camera, as I said, for my Sony ambassador. So I'm using the Sony A1, which is a full frame camera and uh, it has great ISO capabilities. And you, I, I would just recommend if you're uh, any brand do have a good full frame camera, Canon, Nikon, Sony. I, I would avoid using a medium format if you, well, if you don't, so if you have that option, which many of us do because a medium format camera is super expensive and they don't have the same ISO capabilities as a full frame. So, uh, yeah. Many of you guys know about cameras and um, for lenses, I would say uh, an ultra wide angle lens is uh, would be your go to uh, focal length, uh, something around 12 to maybe 15, 16 for me, uh, I feel that I get too little sky, uh, but it, it's all personal preference of course how you like to shoot your landscapes i do prefer those uh, ultra wide angle uh, scenes mm -hmm. and uh when it comes to aperture uh 2.8 is i would say a minimum and you have many good 14 uh, millimeters 2.8 uh lenses like from uh, Rokinen or Samyang or Canon has uh, one I know uh, or you could have these um, zoom lenses uh, 14 to 24 12 to 24 I know Sigma Sonic everyone produces them so no problem and if 
you want those very best lenses, but they are so specific, I would say, like uh, the Sony uh, 14 millimeters, Sigma has the same 1.8. Uh, they are great for capturing the night sky uh, because of the fast, uh, because of the wide aperture at 1.8, you're basically shading off half your ISO uh, need. And yeah, uh, I think that's enough for the lenses, ultra wide angle and uh, 2.8 or faster uh, tripod. Uh, yes, please, because you need... Uh, <laughs> You need a tripod to be able to to shoot for uh, to have your uh, shutter speed lasting for seconds. You're not able to handhold that, even though the iPhone can. But they, in a smartphone, you they use all these uh, all this software to to help you out, and you don't have that in a, in a professional or enthusiast level camera, as far as I know. You do have image stabilization, but that doesn't really help you when you're shooting for five seconds, unless you have supremely stable hands. Uh, filters, I don't use any. I know many of the many brands having these uh, night pollution filters. I don't really care. I do change my white balance uh, in post processing. Uh, which, if we don't have any questions uh, regarding gear, I'll uh, proceed to uh, the settings I use and uh, recommend. Yes, please. Let's see the settings. Uh, yeah, so for Aperture, I was, uh, I'm was i using 2.8. I have a, a zoom lens, the 12 to 24. I use uh 2.8 uh, because it's the fastest i can go and it works really well it is sharp in the corners and everything but that has to do with the lens i mean uh, if you're going with a cheaper lens you will get what's called uh coma in mm -hmm. uh, the corners yeah. where where the stars kind of look like doves uh so uh, I also use uh, the 2.8 for focus stacking. I have tried using uh, 5.6 or something. I do focus stack the images where I feel the need to, where if my tripod is closer to the, uh, to the surface. Mm -hmm. It's the same rules that apply for when you're focus stacking at daytime, basically, but it's more difficult uh, since it's nighttime. So 2.8 gives me that uh, option to see better through the viewfinder and uh, the technique I use I'll get into later on for focus stacking. Shutter speed, uh, I would, it depends on your camera and whether or not you're very picky about your stars, but usually it is a trade-off between shutter speed and ISO. Uh, when you're shooting at 2.8 as an actor or lower, uh, there's if the northern lights go crazy in the sky, which happens maybe three times a year or something like that, where it's super, super crazy and it is so fast that you would see the northern lights basically turning white and uh, purple in the lower parts of the northern lights. You'll be able to shoot the northern lights themselves at uh, maybe two seconds of a shutter speed, which is uh, which is very a very fast shutter speed for northern lights. Normally, however, I do tend to lay around uh, eight seconds to maybe fifteen seconds. I'll get. Uh, well, no need to get into that later because it's uh, it's uh, it's not anything magical. You can uh, measure, and I do use that. Uh, I use that because I only have one camera, so I know that my camera at twelve millimeters can shoot uh, at eight point eight seconds with uh, without having trailing in the stars. Uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, a feature which is uh, which I found, of course, in the PhotoPills app. Mm -hmm. And okay. Spot the stars calculator in PhotoPills. Yeah, uh, and you can also you you plot in your camera and your uh, focal length, and you'll get a measure, uh, a calculation of what uh, shutter speed you need to have. Sharp. Uh, I'm sorry, not sharp stars, but pin. Uh, but pin around stars. Star. Yeah. yeah. However, uh, it's not the end of the world if you have to shoot the northern lights at 12 seconds even though uh, the app suggests for example eight seconds it all it, it is all a relation to the megapixels in your camera and the focal length you're using so uh, it's it makes sense right if you're shooting the northern lights at 70 millimeters it's the same as using binoculars in a sense. Things move a lot faster. So you would need a much faster shutter speed in order to freeze the movement of the stars. So that is also why uh, when shooting deep sky objects, you would need a tracker to, to help you out. Uh, I would not recommend using a tracker for northern lights as they move around as they uh, please themselves and you would get kind of a green mess in your skies, uh, even though the stars would be pin sharp. So uh, for ISO, it uh, depends on the camera you're using. Some uh, cameras are more sensitive, uh, have a better ISO sensitivity. Uh, we have like the A7S series, which is very good at low light. However, they are 12 megapixels. So it's a trade off between megapixels and ISO sensitivity at this point in camera brands, basically. So if you have uh, one of the newer ones at 24 millimeters, they would likely have a better ISO sensitivity than the newer ones at 50 or 60 megapixels. Then again, the 50 or 60 megapixels would be better at capturing uh, scenes with decent light. Uh, so sunset, sunrise, uh, something like that. But during nighttime, the ISO sensitivity of a lower megapixel camera would be better if it's the new, if it's a newer one if you have an older camera let's say a nikon d90 i can't remember how many megapixels maybe 14 or something uh, that was horrible at uh, higher isos uh, white balance of course uh, i do tend to shoot uh, depending on the season and my artistic impressions that I want to give. The northern lights, normally when you have automatic uh, auto white balance, um, you would get a warmer scene uh, during night, which can give you more yellowish northern lights. If you can see in this image here, it's an uh, image of the northern lights with a lot of ice around it. So I used a colder, um white balance around maybe 3300 or so uh the trade-off when doing something like that is uh you guys have seen image of the northern lights i will switch uh swap back to my previous one where you can see hints of magenta in the northern lights mm -hmm. uh, this magenta will turn blue very fast uh, with older, uh, with, yeah, with lo uh, lower uh, Kelvin on your white balance. So it's always uh, a trade-off, and this is why I do these things in post. I do set my white balance to around uh, 3,300, 4,200, or something like that, and it gives me uh, an impression then and there what it looks like, uh, which gives me the uh, creative idea for later on. Sometimes I produce my Northern Lights green and magenta like this, like more like they were, even though it's 
a cold scene in general with all the snow, I can also make this more blueish. But it, it's all an artistic uh, choice. If you want to document the northern lights, you would likely want to stick with a warmer, uh, warmer Kelvin altogether. So in an image like this, for example, with a with a lower temperature on your white balance, it gets more blue. But then again, I've uh, process this to have some green. I don't want the green in the northern lights to turn into too much blue unless it's an artistic choice for the whole image together. Mm -hmm. uh, but the important parts here to sum it up is aperture you want 2.8 or faster, shutter speed I would, uh, depending on the activity of the northern light, sometimes you would need a longer shutter speed in order to capture more of the northern lights. Uh, freezing them uh, always isn't uh, the best choice because if the activity is low, you would likely use this shutter speed instead to capture uh, detail in your landscapes. Mm -hmm. uh, Another fun thing about ISO, because ISO does offer uh, either a clean image or maybe a noisier image. But if you have a full frame camera, and depending on your brand, around 1600 ISO tends to be a sweet spot in order to capture color in uh, the smaller details in the northern lights. If you're capturing curtains of the northern lights, uh, like in an image like this, having a bit higher ISO, like 1600 compared to, for example, 800 would give you these, uh, a better detail in the curtains. And it, it kind of goes against popular belief that a lower ISO would give you a cleaner uh, image. It's not always true for the Northern Lights. You would, would get cleaner mountains and trees and uh, obviously the, the the big scene would be cleaner uh, when it comes to noise but for the very faint details in the northern lights uh, you would want to bump up your ISO mm -hmm. some cameras do it good at 1600 others 3200 and even 6400 but as you increase the number uh, you would lose a color detail uh, because of the ISO. So for me, I find that around 1600 to the 3200 range works really well for my camera. This is something I wouldn't put too much emphasis on, but it's uh, if it's important for you to have all the details, I would I would work in that range with a full frame camera. Awesome. We have a few questions related to yeah. settings, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Shadow B, uh, what should you do if your lens is an, is an f4 or 5.6 aperture? Yeah, so, so normally uh, um, a lens like that is like a medium zoom lens, I, uh, I think. Uh, which would be the equivalent of a 24 to 75 or 100 or something like that. It, do, it doesn't really matter, but F4 uh, is, you basically have to crank up your ISO or your shutter speed in order to capture, uh, to gather more light. It's, uh, it's the trade-off you make with, uh, with an aperture of four. 5.6, mm -hmm. I think, would be hopeless, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you would need a shutter speed for... In, in an example like this, this uh, capture was done at, I think, uh, 8 seconds at ISO 1600, F2.8. No, I'm sorry, uh, F1.8. <laughs> so 
you would have f2, f2.2, f2.4, f2.8, and so on all the way up. And that is the same amount you would have to crank up your ISO and or shutter speed. Mm -hmm. So in order to capture a similar image like this uh, with an eight second shutter speed, you would need to crank your ISO up from 1600 to, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I, well, I would guess 12,000 ISO. And at that point, your image would look uh, like an unloaded image on a phone. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you, thank you. Yeah, and, and, th and that is the problem. I, I recently gave basically the same advice to someone having a 3.5 lens because the difference is so big uh, when it comes to nighttime photography and the amount of noise uh, accumulated in your image from the use of higher ISOs. And uh, the details in the northern lights will become more uh, washed away with a higher shutter speed. So you would want to keep your shutter speed uh, around eight seconds. It seems to be the sweet spot, really. Eight seconds plus minus uh, a stop or two in either direction. Uh, if you use a slow, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a faster shutter speed, which uh, would be two seconds, 2.5 seconds, what happens during uh, a scene like this where you don't have a moonlight is that everything will be a silhouette basically and you would have the northern lights mm -hmm. obviously in um, what I would consider a frozen moment even though it's a two second shutter speed. But you, you would need to, to balance your uh, shutter speed for your landscape as well as the northern lights which makes this tricky or you can do multiple exposures which obviously is something i do from uh, time to time when i find it necessary uh, depending on the landscape of course uh, sometimes uh, it is nice to have a silhouette with some detail in uh, in the landscape uh, this I would consider <laughs> silhouette-ish. I do have its eyes, of course, so they they are quite bright uh, in reality as well. But the mountains in the back here, they don't have any detail. They're obviously not at a zero black level, uh, but you don't see any details in here. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Is this shot a, a multiple exposure? This is a single exposure. This is a single exposure. Okay. Because you yeah. just answered Greg shared question and he was asking you if you prefer shooting single exposures or shoot multiple uh, exposures uh, to blend them afterwards. Uh, yeah, it, it varies so much from scene to scene. I, I wish I would have made this a focus stack, uh, but I didn't mm -hmm. uh, because I was running around like a, a crazy man because the Northern Lights, uh, I, I from what I've seen before, this wouldn't last. So trying to get the, the most out of the fun at that time was a priority uh, in comparison to it. And this image is, uh, I think it's now seven years old or so. And actually, you, you pointed out another question that by Adrian Nobert. He's asking, how much time do we have to find out the correct settings? Uh, is the aurora gone after a few seconds, or is more time to experiment? No, uh, usually when you're out to capture the northern lights, you are heading out early. You're trying to find your composition. This <laughs> Optimally, you're doing this. You're, first of all, you're trying to find a gap in the clouds uh, because you need <laughs> in order to see the northern lights. And you need to stumble around in the dark. I would recommend, obviously, a head torch or something like that in order to find your composition. 
Some cameras can help you with that. I am uh, unfortunately not familiar with uh, Nikon and uh, Canon, the newer uh, cameras, the Set series and uh, the R series from um, Canon. But Sony does have a setting called bright monitoring on their uh, on their cameras, which basically boosts up the uh, the scene, so you're able to see a bit more detail in the foreground, helping you to compose your shot. Uh, if you're out and you're seeing the Northern Lights, you normally get an idea of where the Northern Lights are happening. Very often on the northern horizon uh, in uh, Scandinavia and uh, also Iceland, depending, as uh, I was talking about before, the, uh, the activity level. KP index, of course, is the geographical uh, indication, but also the real time. Uh, disturbance on the geomagnetic field at where uh, at the place you are. Uh, so, uh, in relation to the time you have, you, you might have seconds, well, well, not seconds, say a few minutes to hours. Mm -hmm. um, some nights when the activity level is low, you might have just 15 minutes with good northern lights so when the activity level is good uh, you might have uh, maybe an hour two hour four hours oh. so i would say the initial thing that i would focus on when you're out shooting the northern lights uh, the aperture shutter speed iso white balance all right those are things that you can adjust later on but trying to find focus is critical in order to uh, to get the most possible detail in the northern lights because what you see in the back of your lcd screen uh, is very often a lie uh, compared to what you have uh, when you look at your camera uh, sorry look at your image in lightroom or similar so what I do to find my focus uh, is I find the brightest star in the sky or uh, a distant uh, street light, for example, or a house. And I nudge my uh, focus ring back and forth until that light or that star is at its smallest and do not mistake smallest for being gone altogether because then you're missing your focus um, if you see the star around uh, about where the infinity focus is on your lens uh, it, some lenses have a hard stop infinity like the size uh, 15 millimeter distagon lens but it's uh, you can just turn your focus ring to infinity and you're good to go. But on a zoom lens like I'm using and many are, uh, you would need to find a bright star and kind of uh, focus until it is at its smallest and it's not necessarily uh, at uh, the infinity mark. The same goes for uh, distant house lights and with distance, uh, distant it's uh 100 meters or well 300 feet or so uh would be sufficient because of uh, the uh, because of the focal length of your lens which should be around 14 15 millimeters obviously i understand that some people have um for example, if you have a cropped sensor and your lens is 18 to 55 millimeters, it would be the equivalent, uh, usually around uh, 24 to 70 millimeters. Uh, you would need a more distant uh, subject to find your focus. And finding focus is, is key. And it, you can, of course, tape your uh, lens for example some lenses uh, which you only use for northern lights which would be the sigma i'm sorry the samyang 14 millimeters uh, you can just 
mark it with uh, uh, duct tape or something like that and we'll be good to go for the rest of the season but well finding focus is uh, hard to explain mm -hmm. without doing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it'd be great yeah uh any more questions regarding settings uh, we have uh, a few questions, but I will let you move forward. Maybe and yeah, we can go yeah, we can do them at the end. I will go, I will go through my techniques uh, first, and then uh, we we can do the rest of the questions uh, in the end if that's all right. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, techniques uh, focused stacking, which is what I use uh, the most often when it comes to northern lights. Uh, I would uh, normally, when I'm heading out in the field, I will find my composition and make a calculated risk, uh, and I'll start a time lapse mm -hmm. in hopes that I'll get northern lights in my frame because I I'll, I have an idea of where it is happening. So usually I tend to have some, for example, in this image. Let's say that I, in this case, I like this composition. Sadly, I wasn't able to show the entire image, but uh, I do have it around the web. But uh, anyways, let's say the normal, uh, do you see my cursor, by the way? Yes, yes. Yeah, perfect. So the northern lights, let's say they're starting here on the right side when I start my time lapse. And as the... Uh, and time passes, the northern lights moves more and more towards the middle of my frame, for example. All right. At that point, I will have the frame of the northern lights that I like. At that point, I will uh, basically conclude my northern lights shot and begin my focus stacking backwards, uh, closer and closer to the camera. The way I do that, because I am selfish and usually out alone, I can use my head torch and uh, use the autofocus function. So I will light up the midground, uh, the rocks we see here, and um, make one shot, and of course work my way uh, incrementally backwards. Uh, I say backwards now, but uh, I mean towards myself because I already have the infinity shot and I have it in a time-lapse. So when I have everything from uh, the shoreline here of the mountains in focus, I just need to consider, uh, just need to add the pieces to the puzzle where I have everything else in focus uh, as we progress towards uh, the camera. And I use my head torch and autofocus to achieve this. This is uh, something I found to be the easiest, but do be wary of your surroundings. If you're uh, together with other uh, photographers, they will not be pleased if you uh, swing around with your uh, head torch too much <laughs> because it will ruin their shot for sure. Uh, I know and Nikon and Canon have focus bracketing where you can kind of do the same thing just in camera, but usually you'll end up with more pictures I find, uh, or I found when I had, uh, when I shot with, uh, with uh, Nikon. I'm not familiar with how it works today, but I know Sony does not have uh, a system that works uh, in that way. Uh, apart from if you use their uh, uh, accessory in the form of the remote control, I think it's called Commander something. But uh, when I'm out alone or with a friend, I'll just uh, give them a hint. I will use my flashlight and uh, focus, and it's it works quite well for me. And when it comes to post-processing, while I am focus stacking, this northern lights here will likely move this way or this way. So uh, I'll usually paint in the color as it were, as as it was reflected in um, in the lake or in the pond. 
Uh, focal length blending, I don't use all that much because I'm shooting at uh, as wide as I can because I get the most sky in my shot. I, if I'm feeling creative, uh, I might do a 24 millimeter shot of the uh, of the mountains in the background. It, it depends obviously on the scene I'm shooting, and then I will blend that in and use the 12 or 14 millimeter shot for uh, the sky as well as the foreground. Uh, I do this uh, to avoid distorting too many of the pixels in uh, in the mountains uh, as they would have been if I stretched them. Um, light painting, I don't do that. Um, not a fan because I'm not good enough. <laughs> it takes a lot of practice. Uh, but blue hour blending is something that I uh, do from time to time, especially if I'm shooting uh, in a town or something like that, because I want I want to have the cleanest possible uh, town or street lights and the details in houses and stuff like that. Uh, in a scene like this, I don't bother uh, simply because, uh, well, the night is long and I have uh, very often better things to do than standing here in uh, for four hours waiting for the northern lights in hopes that it will happen. And also the ISO capabilities of cameras these days, and as I uh, will get into later, software will help you a lot and you're, you're good to go without uh, bothering with blue or blends when shooting landscapes mm -hmm. as far as i'm concerned there are many opinions on that of course do you shoot a uh, long exposure sometimes for the foreground uh, we have iman colin asking you if you, you ever take separate exposures for the foreground and much longer shutter speed perhaps yes. four minutes and then blend these in post with a sky image so I uh, usually, in a scene, this is a single exposure, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when I do uh, multiple exposures for the foreground, uh, I will do that in uh, relation to my focus stacking. So mm -hmm. I will shoot the sky for, uh, let's say, eight seconds. And I will use maybe 15 20 or 30 seconds uh for the foreground depending on the foreground uh i will i, I usually have an impression of how much i can push the details in the foreground when i focus back so sometimes when i'm very happy with northern lights and the background i can let's say i've used eight seconds 1600 iso i will uh, balance these two settings so i for, could for example use 15 seconds 800 iso which gives me a clean enough image uh, or well 400 iso if i find that necessary in 30 seconds Finding the same balance that I've used for the sky, I'm just doubling the amount of uh, shutter speed and, uh, well, shaving off the ISO. But then again, uh, you, you would have to find a working balance for yourself, or at least I do. So in this case, 8 second, 1600 ISO would work very well with, for example, uh, 15 or 20 seconds and ISO 800. It gives me a clean enough foreground. And using that uh, 20 second exposure to focus stack myself uh, towards the camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is something I do uh, from time to time, depending on my foreground and how far I am away from it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a scene like this, where 
there is not much detail in uh, the immediate foreground, like a reflection like this. Uh, it's fine enough to have the green uh, reflective light of the northern lights. And if your immediate foreground does not contain details of importance for the image itself, it, it usually will be concealed in, for example, a vignetting. Mm -hmm. So it, it's all a uh, creative process for me. And obviously, you would have to make a trade off for what works for you. I do find images that are uh, focused back from the very immediate foreground throughout the image, very pleasing if they are done correctly uh, with uh, dodging and burning. And you can, you can make however much you want of your image. Whatever you find is good enough is good enough because this is your hobby or your profession. So your personal touch to just that is uh, what really matters. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And as I was talking about before, software on uh, here, you can see the spot stars and how that works. Uh, <laughs> it is in the photo pills app. Which is nice to just if you have one camera plot in the settings you uh, prefer. And as you can see here, uh, on default with a little trailing in your stars, 17 seconds or well, 15 seconds, uh, unless you're using bulb mode and you're uh, mm -hmm. very uh, <laughs> precise with your uh, stopwatch. Uh, this is usually fine, to be honest. Uh, you're shooting at four, in this case, 12 millimeters the stars will be so small that any trailing really uh, doesn't matter that much uh, when you're shooting ultra wide angle. However, uh, if you're uh, so <laughs> anything uh, like me and many other photographers, they want everything to be just perfect. You would have eight second shutter speed and your stars would be pin sharp. Uh, in relation to shutter speed. Uh, but in order to receive those pin sharp stars, you will need to nail your focus as well, uh, or else it will look like uh, yeah, little snow globes. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of, uh, yeah, they look weird. And especially when you zoom in, you would have usually, if you miss your focus, you can have uh, dark, uh, a telltale sign is dark uh, spots in the middle of where your star were supposed to be because your focus has expanded the star beyond or below what is focus. Uh, this, if this were, was a circle, it would kind of look like uh, a star that was not in focus if this was, well, circular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I use. Lightroom and Photoshop, of course, as many do. Some use um, the other app. I can't remember what it's called anymore because it's been so long. Uh, phase one, uh, what's that app called? Uh, uh, Canaro and Skyloom. Luminar. Uh, no, not Luminar. It's, uh, it is, I think it's the same guys that produced the software for phase one and also the Fuji film that used to use that application instead of Lightroom. I can't remember the name. I know Rachel uses that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. I use Lightroom and Photoshop. I also, uh, as I was talking about before, uh, with the corrective, uh, with the noise reduction software that I use, I use DxO uh, Pure Raw and or uh, Topaz, it should be a set here, not X, uh, Topaz mm -hmm. Denoise. Uh, the DxO Pure Raw, I find, does a really good job uh, smoothing out any noise and also uh, bringing back detail in a high ISO shot, 
which is nice for the northern lights and uh, night photography in uh, general maybe not deep sky uh, imagery but uh, well and topaz b noise is something that i use if i have been uh, if i'm to say it mildly been too creative in my post processing trying to pull out too much uh, detail uh, i will use this uh, this application in the end uh, to uh, to sort out my noise issues there is obviously a trade off here uh, because reducing noise uh, if you do it uh, if you're too heavy handed with your noise reduction, you will obviously lose detail. And it is also, I think, important to remember that you're shooting at night. It is acceptable to have noise, even though, even though I've seen lately on uh, Facebook uh, ads that it's not uh, acceptable. But if you've noticed the images, they do lose some, uh, some detail. And you also have to take in mind uh, what, where you are reviewing your image. Is it on Instagram? Because at that point you can shoot uh, anything at 12,800 ISO and be fine. But if you're, if you're viewing it on a larger screen, it all depends on the device or medium that you're using to display your image. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is an important uh, point to software in general. Uh, where are you showing off your image? Or if it's for yourself uh, and you need to uh, nitpick it, uh, I, I would balance, uh, I, I would be careful with putting in too much noise. Uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, the software things, photo pills, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but for me, photo pills, it's for it's good for moonrise, sunset, and well, I said moonrise, I meant sunrise, sunset, <laughs> moonrise, <laughs> or an hour, uh, hour. <laughs> especially shooting uh, for northern lights. It's important to know where the moon is in relation mm -hmm. to where you want to shoot if you're planning to shoot on a specific location you might want to shoot with uh, the moon being on your left or right uh, if it's behind you you would have the same uh, and the same challenges if uh, you're shooting with the sun in your back you would have your uh, tripod the shadows in your image mm -hmm. So uh, keeping in mind where the moon is uh, obviously is important, but you're not able to control it uh, in relation to the northern lights as much as you can with sunset and sunrise, which is more static. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was talking about my resources before. Uh, so um, on this page that I've called real time, magnetograms <laughs> there we go uh, you'll find uh, on your left hand side uh, locations uh, Tromsø, Andenes, Reykjavik and most of the places where you're where you're able to see the northern lights Svalbard for example and using this uh graph here will give you an indication of what is going on you you're likely outside at this point but if you see this graph rising up you know that something is about to happen now if it kind of uh climbs uh steeply above this green line basically and as you can see from this image there's been a lot of activity uh, september 5th so two days ago around midnight um, yeah 
And, and the KP index, I mean, it's a commercialized, uh, it's been way too commercialized. It's, it's giving you at best an indication of what can happen in uh, around the same latitudes as London and similar because we don't measure the KP index uh, up north. Mm. Tori, we have a question uh, regarding this graph from Barney Kotsalka. What is the blue Barney. line showing? <laughs> okay, uh, again, for the third time, I think, I'm not a scientist. But this blue line here gives an indication of uh, of the angle of the magnetic field. So normally you would have northern lights moving from west to east or east to west, depending on uh, depending on the magnetic field. But if it uh, diverts up or down from uh, from the static position, or more or less static position, it, it would have an angle uh, coming in. So from the southeast or uh, northeast, northwest, southwest in the sky. I do not pay much uh, attention to where the angle is because when I am out shooting and as many would be I, I, you can't really rely on the northern lights coming in from northeast or northwest. Uh, sorry, yeah, northeast or northwest. You would have a baseline of where the northern lights are, and you can expect them to move south or north or just create a fantastic display right in front of you uh, from where you are shooting. Uh, th that's how I do it anyway. And I know there are scientists out there that can read this graph a whole lot better mm -hmm. than I can. But it, it gives you an indication. Uh, green is uh, good, especially green is good when it moves uh, up and down, and especially with the higher spikes and uh, low, lower lows. This means that there's a lot happening. So a lot of northern lights uh, in movement at this point. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, if you're out shooting the Northern Lights and it's you have a week, you kind of have to give it your all because you, you can get an indication of is it going to happen, but you can't really be picky about it. Mm -hmm. You have your six nights out and you have to make the most out of it. Uh, if it's cloudy, uh, get some sleep and try again. Mm -hmm. yeah. The more you try, the better, for sure. W one more time. The more you try, the better. <laughs> That's for exactly, sure. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like always. I think, I think if you're not able to read graphs like this, uh, I'm, I'm not a professional in reading these. Uh, I do go out and I spend a few hours out trying to look for a composition and the Northern Lights as well. Uh, but then again, I, I live here, so I, I can be a bit loose when I do this. <laughs> uh, I would recommend uh, if you're super interested in uh, the science behind the Northern Lights, uh, there's a photographer called Adrian, uh, Nightlight Films. He is uh, very, very good in uh, the science behind the Northern Lights. Really good. Adrian? Adrian, yes. Uh, let me just have a look. Night Lights Films uh, is his... Uh, Night Lights um, Films. What yeah. is there? Yeah. Okay. 
he, he has courses as well in reading these graphs. So he, uh, he is really, really good. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think he might even have a degree in, uh, in the Northern Lights. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. We have a few questions left, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Go. Um, we have Wayne Paget. Uh, what about lens warmers in terms of the equipment? Do you use any any warmer for the lens or to prevent no moisture? No, I think. No. No. Uh, the thing is, when I shoot Northern Lights, and it's um, uh, during winter, especially, uh, you're out for a long time shooting, and I leave my camera in the backpack for it to uh, to, to kind of. I'm missing the English word here, but to to warm up together with the backpack in that order, I'm able to to avoid any condensation uh, within uh, the lens. I do, however, snatch out my memory card and uh, and do that stuff. But I can, I can leave my backpack closed inside my uh, my uh, my house while uh, mm -hmm. while it is warming up again. So it's usually not a problem. Obviously, if you're changing locations a lot, you would do the same thing. You would keep your camera in your backpack closed in the car because the car would be warmer than it's outside and it basically works the same thing you don't have to worry too much about condensation if you do it like that mm -hmm. good thank you then we have adrian nobert uh, how do you expose a waterfall in the fire element um, take, take different shots one for the fire element and one for the sky or but eight seconds is not too bad for a, for, for a waterfall either. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, to me, that is a creative uh, choice. Uh, a creative choice, yes. Because uh, you, if you expose, it depends on the waterfall. But, but for example, Skuga Foss, which is a very open, a very open scene in Iceland. Uh, but it's very dark there as well, unless you have the moon. So you, I, I really don't uh, put too much emphasis on the exposure time I use for that waterfall, because usually you would end up with 15 seconds, 30 seconds or so. Uh, if it's uh, a little moon or no moon, um, you would have to have some sort of light to get a shutter speed slow enough, I mean fast enough, to get more detail in that waterfall. Um, if I'm shooting a stream, for example, I might, if I'm standing in the stream, uh, with my tripod and everything in the water. Uh, maybe I'll try to, uh, to use a shorter shutter speed and then stacking my images. But normally it's not worth the effort, uh, in my opinion. So uh, it, it all depends on your creative choice for that uh, waterfall. Maybe you can up your ISO a whole lot to get more uh, texture in the water because usually it will turn out white because of the long exposure you have to use anyway. Uh, and you'll be able to conceal the noise in the water using uh, mm -hmm. software like Topaz Denoise, or even in Lightroom or Photoshop. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Next question from Greg Scher. Uh, have you used the Tamron 1728 uh, F2.8 on your Sony 4 Aurora? If so, 
Were you happy with the sharpness stars etc? ETC? I'm I'm sorry, I, I haven't. Uh, on my uh, the only third uh, what, what is it called third part? Yeah, third party lens I used uh, whether I'm shooting uh, Nikon or uh, Sony has been well. I've used two. I've actually used the the Sigma 14 millimeters and also the Rokin on one. Uh, from what I've seen uh, from the the Tamron 17 to uh, 28, was it? Uh, yeah, 35 uh, maybe. Uh, the, the problem is for me, as I was talking about initially when I talked about gear, is that once you pass the 15 millimeter uh, threshold, uh, things you, you get less sky in your image because at some point you need to balance the foreground and the sky the northern lights speaks for themselves and you very often want most uh, the most possible northern lights in your image but still you want to balance with your foreground so uh, it all obviously depends on how you shoot uh, if you're able to to get your foreground in at 17 millimeters at the same time as you're able to get the amount of northern lights in your shot that you like you'll be fine with the tamron for sure but for me uh, then again i usually use the extremes so 12 or 14 it all depends i 14 and uh, 12 are the two focal lengths that I have used the most well, and also 15 from uh, from size, mm -hmm. uh, which had the hard stop infinity. But then again, it's a uh, prime lens, and it it only kind of le led me to use it during uh, during night time, where I also had. Uh, the Nikon uh, 14 to 24 millimeters, and well, you're you're paying a whole lot of money for hard stop infinity uh, in that case, and so I sold it. It, it wasn't uh, simply yeah. wasn't worth mm -hmm. the uh, the extra cost for for that benefit when you can easily find focus yourself with some practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last question, uh, because we're getting to the end, is almost one hour and 40 minutes here. Uh, yeah. We have, uh, let me see, Jeff Bo. How does the moon affect exposure times? The last one. Yeah, uh, at full moon, uh, I will find this image here. Uh, if I, uh, do you see my Lightroom now? Mm -hmm. Perfect, and I will find uh, not this one, but yeah, here we go. Uh, also, the full image of what I showed you it is six seconds shutter speed, and I've darkened this image a whole lot because you can see barely here a halo. Mm -hmm. which is from the moon that uh, that hangs in the sky around here-ish. Mm -hmm. So the moon will give you a slower shutter speed, which in my opinion can uh, be an advantage if you, if you take it, meaning you can use a shutter, a lower ISO and a, a little bit slower shutter speed but then again uh six seconds for me here uh, gave me a whole lot more of the northern lights uh because of the moon uh, i could have used uh, a little bit uh faster shutter speed and had more details in the strongest part of the northern light but then again i would be losing out on the faint, uh, faint details. Uh, and it, it all becomes a creative process. Uh, I would, yeah. 
if you're shooting the northern lights i don't mind the full moon i don't mind no moon at all you kind of have to work with what you're given because the weather changes all the time so uh, if it's blue uh, clear sky and a full moon you have to take it if it's hmm. uh, uh, if it's no moon and full moon, clear sky so you have to t- deal with it as well and um i was going to show an image here yeah it, it's the one we talked about earlier uh, mm-hmm. eight second f1.8 iso 1600 single, uh, shot. Mm-hmm. single shot yes uh while i have this one here uh, which gives uh, kind of uh, an example of a focus stacked image and here uh, i have focus stacked uh, my way back here with the largest that was laying in the river uh, on the river bank here but these images here are shot at six seconds uh, if it's obviously which base file you use giving you an uh, indication of what shutter speed was used but six seconds at 2.8 3200 iso which seems like uh, a very high iso for a full moon uh given that you have um, an idea of how bright it is but the full moon here kind of brightens up this mountain side here which i wouldn't have been able to do in uh, in post mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but for the sky here i used 2.5 seconds and iso 3000 200 because it was moving so fast you can see in the northern lights here uh very uh curtain like details in the bottom part of the northern lights here which is um which is the advantage of using a fast shutter speed you will get more detail in the northern lights very often if it's moving fast it it, it, it kind of it's a basic uh, photography Mm -hmm. Uh, Uh, and the same goes for northern lights but we don't always have that option but we do normally want to shoot the northern lights as fast as possible but we have to consider uh, the brightness of the overall image Mm -hmm. so if I had shot this at one second it would be of course uh, um, maybe even uh, dark to black sky with uh, pinned stars and the northern lights you would see um, the brightest parts of it in uh, better detail but you would lose out on the subtle details in the northern lights it, it's always uh, it's always a balance of what you want to achieve it sounds very creative to shoot the northern lights but uh, it's the same thing when you're shooting a sunset you want all the details in the clouds using a fast shutter speed will give you those details but your land portion will be well darker and that is why we often do hdr for example so this would be some sort uh it, it kind of would be the R in the sense that i'm using a longer shutter speed to get a brighter foreground mid-ground and background here in the mountains and a shorter sub- shutter speed to get mm-hmm. the detail in the northern lights but sometimes you don't have that option and have to balance it all out maybe in one exposure or it, it all depends on how much effort you want to put into the northern lights so if you get a good display of northern lights i would normally at that point focus stack my way back and take the time it takes to do that focus stack because i know i have a really good sky now and Mm -hmm. may I, i do want the option to make this image as good as possible with adding that focus stack in the end 
that is also why I do the time lapses when I see the northern lights are in the sky and moving and I do a time lapse for let's say 20 minutes or so mm -hmm. to, uh, to get the most amount of northern lights or the shape of northern lights that I uh, prefer and then focus stack my way to the camera again. Great, great, fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Amazing images, man. Thank you so <laughs> much. Beautiful, beautiful. I gotta go to uh, Norway or Iceland or uh, a place like that to to experience the Northern Lights. I experienced them in uh, New Zealand, but not, not the Northern Lights in the Austra uh, Australia <laughs> lights in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, uh, it was spectacular. So, wow, this is beautiful. Great. Yeah. So uh, I, I was talking about, uh, to kind of wrap this up, uh, one of the techniques when, when we would do our blending. Mm -hmm. Because when you're shooting this location, this specific location here, you would have the sea lodges here. And during night, it is very bright because everyone wants the light on in their living room, of course. And you're standing on top of a bridge with street lights. Uh, so you kind of want to keep your uh, ISO at a minimum because, or else, as you can barely see here, I have some sort of light bleed coming in uh, from uh, the street lights on, uh, on the bridge. And then you would have to do uh, another exposure for the northern lights uh, because using the same exposure time for all of it would be, it would blow out the lights in uh, this little island here. But it, it all comes down to the same creative process that you use for photography in general. If you want a different, movement in the uh, in the waves you have to use a different shutter speed if you want a different exposure for the sky you have to do a different exposure for the sky it, it's basically the same principles it's the difference is the shutter speed and iso uh, balancing you have to do in order to get uh, the cleanest possible image with the most amount of detail fantastic Great advice, man. It's been a tremendous class <laughs> on uh, another life photography. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, it was my uh, my pleasure, and uh... thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, anything you want to add? Where can we find you? Where where, where people can follow you? Your work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I have this. Uh... <laughs> My, uh, I'm active on Instagram and uh, beginning again to become active on Facebook. And you'll find me under my name and also uh, my website here, twitteronesco.com. Mm -hmm. cool. And it is also possible to join me and Sapna Reddy in March as we're uh, taking on the Northern Lights in uh, the Lofoten Islands, uh, which you'll find information on either my uh, website or uh, Sapna's if you already know her. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I know Sapna Reddy. I met her in uh, Kanab in uh, Utah uh, this year, only this year. and. She will be teaching here live for us to uh, in a couple of months. So she's great, and man, you and Sanna under the Northern Lights, epic adventure. So I invite you guys to check out the website, uh, you are the photos and also the, the expedition. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for uh, for having me. And thank you guys for, uh, for taking the time, even though it's uh, the launch of the new iPhone. So <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, is it today? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think it's already over. Okay, okay. Uh, I think there are much better things to do than uh, watching the iPhone thing. But yeah, being here with yeah. us. Thank you guys for joining us. It's almost two hours live on...
uh, Northern Life Photography. It's been great. Thank you so much, uh, Sora, Ivar, again for being here. And I think it's time to say goodbye. Yeah, and um, if there are any uh, afterburner uh, questions, feel free to shoot me a DM mm -hmm. on, uh, on Instagram or on email through my website, and I'll gladly answer your questions in relation to settings, uh, gear, and whatever you need to know about capturing the Northern Lights when and where and whatever you wonder. Awesome, awesome. I know some people are uh, already planning adventures to photograph the Northern Lights in uh, Lofoten and in Iceland. So guys and girls, if you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to contact him. He will be pleased to join you, to, to help you. Okay, as I said, it's time to say goodbye. If you like this video, guys, uh, give us a like, subscribe, and I'll see you next Wednesday in another video. And... Remember, I had the power to imagine, plan, and shoot legendary photos. Bye bye, bye bye. Thank you so much, Thor. Ivar, thank you so much. See you soon. Yeah, thank you. See so you. Much.